Video games have had quite a decade. We saw the twilight years of one console generation and the rise of another. We observed industry legends rise and fall. We watched the boom of digital distribution, which led to waves of amazing indie games. But most of all, we played online, offline, solo or with friends. This decade has been the best I've experienced in terms of what I've played. Now, how do I even start with a list like this? Obviously, I personally have completed over 300 games over this last decade, but I've played hundreds more that I haven't talked about. I wanted to celebrate this decade with games that I loved, but this top 10 is also a celebration of the show, of what the completionist represents. So my top 10 list is going to be a little bit different than a lot of other stuff going around online. I have picked one game for each of the best 10 years that I think is the absolute cream of the crop. And I'm pitting those 10 against one another in the ultimate battle royale. So for example, my number 10 may be from 2015 and my number nine may be from 2011. As usual, this list represents my opinion and mine alone. So if you don't like it, you can just leave. Or, you know, stay around and watch the video and hear me talk about some incredible video games. Your call. So without further ado, here are my top 10 games of the decade. Number 10. Playing the perfect video game sequel. It sounds elusive, almost like experiencing a perfect sunset or finding the perfect meatball sub. Something you experience rarely, if ever. When Valve released Portal 2 in 2011, I thought to myself, there is no way that this game could be anywhere near as good as the first Portal. I have never been so happy to be wrong. Portal 2 takes everything great about the first Portal and folds in more. More puzzles, more mechanics, more snarky robots. It's an unbelievable accomplishment that shouldn't work as well as it does. But then again, it's it's Valve, who has a history of nailing sequels out of the park while never making threequels. Portal 2 is hilarious, poignant, and deviously smart. Even the co-op is fully realized, and some of the most fun I've ever had playing a puzzle game. You can make the robots high-five everyone. That alone makes this one of my favorite games of the last 10 years. If I had to use one phrase to describe Portal 2, I think the only way is to steal the words from GLaDOS herself. This is a triumph. Number 9. There's no denying that The Completionist is a pretty Zelda-heavy channel, right? But listen up, buckaroos. It's for a good reason. Zelda games are generally so lovingly considered and well-designed that I can't help but fall in love again every time I play a new one. But when Nintendo takes risks and makes weird Zelda that subverts expectations, that's what really gets me going. That's why 2013's The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds is the only Zelda game on this list. It's impossible to talk about this 3DS game without mentioning its SNES predecessor. If you're of a certain age, like me, me, you probably have enough knowledge of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past to play through it blindfolded. It's a legitimate classic that anyone interested in game design or just good games in general absolutely needs to play at some point in their lives. A Link Between Worlds felt like it was made for me and anyone else who grew up loving A Link to the Past. Playing A Link Between Worlds is like peeking behind the curtain of nostalgia. It feels familiar yet different, like visiting your childhood home 20 years after moving away. The structure of the building is all the same, but the rooms are all rearranged. But rather than feel unsettling, the remix version of Hyrule offered in this game feels fresh and inspirational. I was compelled to plumb every inch of the map for Easter eggs and throwbacks, and I was never disappointed. This game is a modern classic, even if you've never played A Link to the Past before. And for me, A Link Between Worlds and A Link to the Past battle each other each and every day in my life as my absolute favorite Zelda game of all time. And that's saying a lot considering my longtime favorite has always been A Link to the Past since I was a kid. And you know what? Even the 3D is good in this game. The 3DS is cool as hell and had some awesome tech behind it. And A Link Between Worlds actually tries to do something with it. Mad props. Number 8. Borderlands has been one of my favorite comforts ever since The Completionist started. The first game is a legend in my book, and Borderlands 2 is my pick for the year 2012. It takes everything that's great about the first game and improves upon it. The gameplay and gun play is tighter and more awesome feeling, the characters and abilities are more varied and interesting, and the sharp humor is dialed up even further. The story is vastly improved upon, with an action 
actual antagonist in the form of Handsome Jack. But more than just mechanical improvements, Borderlands 2 is on this list because of what it represents to me beyond the gameplay. The game is not perfect by any means, but it represents more than just a fun loot shooter. Borderlands hype was super high in 2012, and I got caught up in it because of how much I liked the first game and how much I enjoyed doing it for the show. I even wanted a Borderlands 2 Collector's Edition so badly, but I went to six different game stops and three Best Buys before finally getting a copy. And not to get too meta with everything, but this game is also where I would go to vent at the end of a long day. It never felt like work. It's just fun, relaxing, and incredibly soothing in this weird way. Pandora may be a screwed up place, but it also feels like home to me because when I'm gun zerking my way around in Borderlands 2, I know I'm with friends. And for a while, everything is all right. Number seven. The year 2010 was a gaming gold mine, and I had a hell of a time picking a favorite from that year. It was a year of incredible sequels and ambitious open world games, but it was also the year of blasting through space while riding a familiar dinosaur in what I would call my favorite 3D Mario game ever made, at least until a certain other Mario game came out several years later. For right now though, it's Super Mario Galaxy 2. This game is so easy to love. Everything about playing it is joyful. The music is triumphant and soaring, somehow even better than the first Mario Galaxy. It's visually gorgeous. Nintendo just going even harder on the stuff that makes Mario Mario. And Yoshi! There's no better way to make Mario feel more like a powerhouse than by adding Yoshi. Especially when he puts his little adorable arms out to the side like he's a jet plane. And of course, who could forget our favorite purple boy Lubba, aka Biggie Smalls, creating a weird floating Mario head spaceship. One of the strangest things in Mario history that I feel like no one ever talks about, you know? Every little quirk in the art direction is incredible memorable to me. I loved the challenge of this game, and I think Super Mario Galaxy 2 marks a shift in Nintendo realizing how much they could experiment with an established formula. Like, there's no real reason to make a direct sequel to Super Mario Galaxy other than Nintendo realizing that they had more to say in that universe. This sequel is incredible, and one of the Wii's absolute best. What a wonderful way to send off a legendary system. Number 6 The Moon Landing Stonehenge Final Fantasy XV. So many impossible things have happened over the course of history. And to me, the fact that Final Fantasy XV was actually made, released, and fun to play in this decade is proof that there are higher powers at play in this universe. And I know I'm gonna catch some flack here since my number one in my top 10 of 2016 video was in fact Overwatch and not this game. But you know what? As I put more time into both games and I put a few more years behind me, my views have changed. I love that this game is about growing up and changing perspectives. And I think that's reflected in my choice to put this game on this list. So playing a Final Fantasy game has always been a ritual for me and my brother. Whenever a new Final Fantasy is released, I turn into a hermit with him and shut ourselves away until the game is done. Final Fantasy XV was unlike any other Final Fantasy before it, and I couldn't get enough of it. This game is the ultimate road trip, and I've never wanted to hang out with a group of friends more. I love being able to throw on classic Final Fantasy tunes while I tool around in my out of place yet exactly perfect convertible. I love the battle system, which is chaotic, but just feels cool as hell. But the best part about Final Fantasy XV is the biggest reason why I love it. It's the fact that this is the first Final Fantasy in a long while that has an all-encompassing theme for all walks of life. This game is about brotherhood, legacy, death, sadness, betrayal, and through it all, these four boys are there for each other. They stick together, and it's beautiful. I think the gorgeous Florence and the Machine cover of Stand By Me at the very beginning of the game says it all. I won't be afraid as long as you stand by me. Number five. I consider myself a creative person. Producing this show is incredibly rewarding, and with every episode that comes out, I feel a sense of pride and accomplishment. Creating stuff feels good, full stop. And Super Mario Maker helped supercharge that feeling for me. Creating levels in that game and watching others play them or playing and sharing levels that other people have built is still a mind-blowing experience. The fact that Nintendo basically threw the entire world a bone and said, you know what, here are all the toys, go nuts, is still incredible. Nintendo rejuvenated what it means to play a Mario game by bringing him back to his roots and letting others share what Mario means to them. Mario levels are such a known quantity 
popularity in video game culture that it was and still is an incredible delight to see what people would come up with during the time this game was out at its peak in 2015. Also, the costumes. If you're a Nintendo fan or have a huge amiibo collection, the unlockable costumes in Mario Maker will instantly fill up your nostalgia meter. This game also marks the start of my journey with Nintendo. Now, I worked with Nintendo on so many different promotional materials before this, but for this game, it's where it really kicked into gear, and I started to build my relationship with them around this time. It's been a great partnership and literally a lifelong dream, and Super Mario Maker is all tied to that. And although Super Mario Maker 2, which came out on Nintendo Switch last year, has made tons of improvements to the Mario Maker formula, it still doesn't feel nearly as revolutionary. I mean, how could it? The first Mario Maker was such an incredible bonding experience for everyone who had a Wii U. Mario Maker 2 is an incredible accomplishment, but the first one represents a perfect moment in time where all of us were figuring out the best way to pay tribute to something we all love, Mario. Number four. Have you ever seen a grown man scream at the top of his lungs because of a video game? Wait, don't answer that, most of you already have. If you have watched any of my E3 coverage from this last year, you would instantly say yes, and that's because of the reveal of a certain Baron Bird duo that made their debut for the next game on this list. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate from 2018 is one of the hypest games of the decade for any number of reasons. But I think one of them is the sheer possibility space that's been unlocked ever since Joker's reveal for the fighter pass. It feels like for the first time ever, practically any video game character in history is on the table as a potential fighter reveal by one of the best fighting game franchises ever. And credit to Sakurai, he has created an unstoppable hype juggernaut and he has fans in the palm of his hands as we breathlessly wait for the next character unveiling. But the amazing thing is, it isn't just Nintendo fans anymore. Smash Ultimate is a comprehensive celebration of video games as a medium, and every aspect of this game reinforces the love of video game history and the future yet to come. And of course, for me, Cloud Strife and Banjo-Kazooie. I cried, folks, when I saw that Jiggy roll across the floor. I laughed and cried and screamed all at the same time. And that's the real power of this game. Number three. There is a lot of left behind in the last decade, even more that I've left behind in the last 20 years. And yet, some things have followed me, crept and shambled from the dark recesses of the past into my present. It feels sick and twisted to say that I am grateful to still be chilled by what scared me as a kid. The Resident Evil 2 remake released in 2019 is an absolute masterclass in how to take a masterpiece and update it. This game is more than a game. It's a bone chilling thrill ride that absolutely terrified me. I didn't think I needed it, but once this remake got its hooks in, it didn't let me go. I didn't want it to. Capcom absolutely crushed it with this remake. They took a beloved game and improved it. This remake looks like now what it looked like in my nightmares from 20 years ago. Vivid and terrifying altogether. RE2 is my surprise top game of 2019, because I thought, you know, something new would topple it. And I feel absolutely no shame talking about it once again so soon. It might not be a wholly brand new game, but I don't care. It stuck with me, like Survivor's Guild for anyone lucky enough to escape Raccoon City. It is far and away the most mesmerizing horror experience I've had in years. Not to mention challenging and incredibly rewarding. It also has one of the most satisfying completion processes with incredible rewards for each successful playthrough. This game is the perfect example of how to revive a classic. Number two. Now, I've talked a lot about sequels in this top 10. There have been any number of great follow-ups in the last decade, but there's only one game that is simultaneously a follow-up, a spiritual successor, a herald of what's to come, and a non-stop nostalgic celebration of everything that came before it. I'm talking about my new favorite 3D Mario game of all time, Super Mario Odyssey. Even hearing Jump Up Superstar to this day gets me pumped. This game is my mother freaking Super Bowl. How it took Nintendo as long as it did to combine musical theater and Mario is a mystery, but I'm glad they finally solved it. This game is a never ending string of delightful discoveries. Letting Mario take the form of practically every enemy in the game never stops being amazing. And I'm still laughing about the frog with the mustache from the game's first world. Super Mario Odyssey captures the excitement of playing Super Mario 64 for the first time. That rush of realizing that Mario can go anywhere. There are power moons everywhere, and I always felt like I was earning something for exploring. I felt like the developers were begging me to explore every inch of the world 
world, and I wanted to do so. Everything about this game rules, and it makes me even more excited to see what Nintendo does in the future with their most popular character. So as we come down to this final entry in this list, my personal game of the decade, there are of course one or two or 20 games that aren't on this list. Incredible games that if they were released in any other decade would easily be on the list. So with that said, I'm gonna talk about a couple of titles that I was really passionate about that didn't quite make the cut. First up, God of War 2018. God of War 2018 has never made me more excited for a God of War game. This is a story about a father and son, and it's got tons of awesome combat. Sonic always gets made fun of for not having a good game, but honestly, I love all Sonic games. Even if I don't like them, I still appreciate them. But one of my favorite games to come out of this decade had to have been Sonic Mania. It felt like Sonic 3 and Knuckles Plus came out and we just had such a great time experiencing it. When I think of the decade, I have to talk about the one game that really blew everyone away. And that, my friends, was Undertale. Undertale has become this cultural phenomenon in the last couple of years that really has changed how we look at games and storytelling. And overall, it probably has some of the biggest heart I've seen in a game in quite some time. And one that I have to absolutely talk about has to be Breath of the Wild. Now, personally, I'm not a big fan of these open world games and the way that they've done them, but when it comes to Zelda, this was the best choice they could have gone with. A big playground for everyone to just explore as Link. Now, I could go on for hours about all four of these games, and in fact, I actually have in-depth videos on them. So if you want to hear more, check them out. But with that said, it's time to focus on my number one game of the decade. Number one! The year 2014 going into 2015 was one of the hardest in my entire life. My personal and professional lives were falling apart, and I became a target online in ways that I never would have imagined, being doxxed and being personally and professionally targeted by thousands of people all over the world. It was an incredibly difficult year for the show and for myself, and I wasn't even sure I still wanted to do it. And on top of all that, I lost my mom. Anyone who's been through this kind of trauma knows that it is truly indescribable. Yet somehow in the middle of all this, I found the game that would save my life. Shovel Knight is my game of the decade, and it isn't simply because it's an extremely good video game. Shovel Knight was exactly what I needed to find myself again. I discovered Shovel Knight through a series of fortunate events. Now, I met the composer and my good friend Jake Kaufman for the very first time at a party for a game called Mighty Number no. 9, and he told me about this game he was working on. We clicked and instantly became fast friends. I had never even heard of Shovel Knight or Yacht Club games, but the game became both an escape for me and a solace that helped remind me of why I love video games in the first place. The amount of work and care and love that was poured into this game is immediately clear and an instant reminder of what putting your passion into your work looks like. No other game has made me reflect as much on my life or the decade as a whole as Shovel Knight. I formed a relationship with this game and I played it non-stop for six or seven months. And for those of you out there who have no idea, Plague Knight, Spectre Knight, King Knight, they're all out and they're free if you own the fucking game. There's even a fucking Smash Bros game in it. Shovel Knight Showdown. And I cannot thank them enough for all of the hard work. I know there are going to be times when the work outweighs the play or when the hard stuff overwhelms the good, but we just gotta keep digging our way through it, coming out the other side stronger and wiser. So that was my weird battle royale top 10 games of the decade. What are your weird battle royale top 10 games of the decade? Let me know in the comments down below. And hey guys, it's a brand new year. It's a brand new decade, which means we're gonna get a lot of crazy stuff. In the next few months, we're getting so many good games. Let me know what games you're excited for in 2020 in the comments down below. That's it, that's all you guys. And I'll see you all next time.